Washington Journal continues. Cliff Young joins us now for a discussion on NAFTA and U.S. and Canada relations. He serves as president of Ipsos Public Affairs in the United States, and some viewers may be more familiar with your work than the name of your organization, so explain what Ipsos does. Well, first and foremost, Ipsos doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a made-up name, uh, but we are a, a global market research and polling firm. Uh, we have offices in 90 countries around the world, and we cover 130, and we're really measuring the pulse of public opinion everywhere. Uh, and specifically in the U.S. And, and Canada, which we're going to look at the data today. How does Ipsos make money off its polling? Well, really, it's uh, we work with with media, and we make media we make money from media with governments, with private sector. So a whole host of different stakeholders. We do different sorts of things. Some of it's more related to communications. Other of, of it is more related to a public policy. But we work with a whole host of different institutions. Among the topics you focused on this week, U.S.-Canada relations and NAFTA. Why? Why? Well, because first and foremost, it's in the news. Uh, but more importantly, and I think conceptually, uh, we're very interested in public opinion and its relationship to leaders. And so when uh, administrations like the Trump administration is taking a new course, America First course, where it's really pushing back on traditional allies in terms of um, economic relations uh, and the like, we want to understand where does public opinion fall um, in re respect to this initiative and in respect to the Trump administration. And fortunately enough, we also have a poll uh, from Canada as well, so we can, we'll be able to compare both Americans and Canadians. So how do Americans feel about NAFTA? Well, in general and historically over the last 25 years, uh, they support it. Um, there's super majority support both in the United States as well as Canada. 71% of Americans uh, are in favor of NAFTA. Um, uh, Eighty-six percent of Canadians, so broad-based support in abstract, in theory. And so you really have to sort of peel away the onion and go down deep, and what you actually find is a little bit weaker support when you ask people about its actual benefits. So only 54 percent of Canadians believe that NAFTA is benefiting them specifically, and 42 percent of Americans. So in abstract, in theory, NAFTA is great, but we're not seeing the concrete benefits. And there, there's a very interesting story. And, and that story is that 42% um, is highly variable. There's very, very different partisan views. Indeed, 62% of, of Democrats believe that NAFTA benefits them. Only 26% of Republicans. And that's changed over time, over the last 25 years. For visual learners, uh, here's uh, the chart showing the breakdown among party lines on whether NAFTA is beneficial. Uh, as you said, 62% of Democrats, 26% of Republicans, 38% uh, of independents saying it's beneficial. Talk about the, the changes over time. The viewers can see the chart here. Why does it seem to be going up among Democrats and uh, why the big dip starting in 2014? Among Republicans. Well, that's great. And, and, and as we understand, historically speaking, Republicans have always been in favor of free trade. And indeed, there was always a majority of Republicans that were in favor of NAFTA. Uh, but over the last few years, uh, even predating the 2016 elections, um, 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 kind of America first sentiment has really crystallized with the Republican base. Um, there's a deep seated uh, uh, distrust of institutions in general, including NAFTA, and that's what we're seeing. So the outcome of the 2016 election, which produced an outsider candidate, an outsider politician like Trump, uh, a strong kind of America first focus, the, the inversion of the data is exactly that. And, and if we really want to step back and think about it, uh, Trump is just being aligned with his base. Uh, the policies he's pushing, both internally, domestically here in the United States, as well as abroad, are, are policies that are aligned with his base, which is very different than it was 20, 25 years ago. We're talking with Cliff Young, uh, the president of U.S. Public Affairs at Ipsos. If you want to join the conversation as we talk about uh, U.S. and Canada relations over NAFTA and trade issues, uh, you can do so this morning. Republicans, it's 202-748-8001. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Independents, 202-748-8002. And a special line, if you're outside the U.S., say in Canada, and want to join the conversation this morning, 202-748-8003. Cliff Young, as folks are calling in, you also polled on the war of words between yeah. President Trump uh, and Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, how do Americans and Canadians feel? How do they perceive that exchange, that fairly heated exchange? Very heated exchange indeed. And, and on, 
almost unprecedented when you think about relations between Canada and the United States. And there's broad-based understanding that this, this row between the two leaders, uh, Trump and Trudeau, will have lasting, uh, uh, a lasting effect, lasting damage on the relationship. Indeed, 81% of Canadians think that and 71% of, of Americans. So there's worry on both sides of the border about this conflict. Uh, specifically, the question is, how do they see the relative performance um, of, of their leaders. And so both Canadians, interestingly enough, both Canadians and Americans uh, approve of how Trudeau is actually handling the situation. 72% of Canadians, 57% of Americans. When it comes to Donald Trump, a very, very different view. A few of the headlines in this morning's paper about those tensions and brings up uh, those war of words. Here's one from the Wall Street Journal, G7 tensions cloud trade outlook. And then another from the Financial Times this morning looking at the Canadian perspective. Trudeau faces loss of goodwill if U.S. puts duties on Canadian cars. Uh, they get into uh, some of the polling as well uh, on Justin Trudeau in the, in the wake of that exchange. What is the value of polling about people's feeling about a specific news event like that? But what we really are looking for is to see to what extent our governments, politicians, parties align with public opinion. Um, are, they, are they pushing forward rhetoric and policies um, that meet public opinion where, where, where it is? Or are they doing something at variance with it? And why do we say that? Because if you're at variance, if you're not aligned with public opinion, you might get away with things in the short term. But in the long term, you reduce your electability. You have a problem pushing forward your agenda. So the key question here was, can we understand the Trump administration's behavior in, in respect to public opinion? In other words, are they aligned with it? And the answer is yes and no. No, generally speaking, Americans are, are fearful of the role that's, that's existing right now between Canada and the United States. It's one of our number one allies. We, we share a huge border, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, when you look specifically at the base, when you look at Republicans, Republicans are much more, as we were seeing before, much more America first in orientation, much less likely to support free trade if it's not fair trade. Um, and so he's aligned with his base when it comes to the conflict with Canada and more generally with the large uh, economic players in the world. What's the answer to those same questions when it comes to Justin Trudeau and the, the Canadian population? Well, they're, they're aligned as well. In other words, they're supporting Justin Trudeau. They don't want to be pushed around. Um, and there's broad-based support uh, for Ju Justin Trudeau, Trudeau, as I was saying, both on the Canadian side as well as on the American side. Um, 37, excuse me, 72% uh, uh, of Canadians uh, agree with how Justin Trudeau is handling the job, 57% uh, of Americans. But there, once again, in the details is the interesting story. Uh, because when you look more specifically, um, you know, only 14% only of Canadians agree with how Trump is handling the job. Uh, in respect to the row, 37% of Americans, but, but, and the qualification is, 78% of Republicans agree with how uh, President Trump is handling the job. Again, once again, the answer is yes and no. No in the sense that overall Americans are worried, but more specifically, yes, because Trump is aligned with his base. You mentioned the details. Here's some of the details about the poll we've been talking about this morning conducted uh, the June 13th through 14th uh, among 1,005 adults in America, uh, 18 plus. Uh, a parallel study also conducted in Canada among roughly uh, 1,001 Canadian adults. Uh, where can viewers go if they want to see this poll and the results? For they can go to our website. And by the way, I will be posting it um, on Twitter uh, right after our talk. And it's ipsos.com is the Ipsos website. Ipsos.com. And talk about the difference between margin of error and credibility intervals, since we have some time to, to break down and have a Getting a into the details, right? Yes. You talk about a, a credibility interval in this poll, uh, but not a term I've heard before. I've heard margin of error. Yeah, we typically and historically have always used margin of error. Uh, we've used it. That's been sort of the gauge of relative precision. Uh, we use something slightly different from a, fa a different family of statistics, the same sort of concept. Uh, ultimately, it, it's a function of how we select the respondents, so in telephone and face-to-face -face surveys, uh, we randomize how we select people, like randomized selections out of a bucket of balls. Um, that's where we use margin of error. Um, in this specific case, for online surveys, we don't select people like that, we recruit them. And so it's not technically correct to use a margin of error to talk about precision. Instead, we use we take from another family of statistics, it's, and, and it's called the credibility interval. But, but um, uh, conceptually speaking, it's the same thing. 
Cliff Young, a self-described polling junkie, with us for about the next 20 minutes this morning on The Washington Journal, taking your questions as we talk about specifically this poll on U.S.-Canada relations. Dan's up first from Tucson, Arizona. Republican, Dan, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for taking my call. Um, my problem with uh, uh, NAFTA is, you know, supposedly we're supposed to be getting this stuff. It's less expensive. You're not paying these people to make this stuff as much as we do in, in, in America. But the quality of the material that we're getting, I mean, back in my day, I mean, a dishwasher would last three, four, five, six years. I'm still taking dishwashers out that last forever. And nowadays, you can't get a dishwasher that lasts for a year. And that's what I got to say. Thank you very much for taking my call. Dan, thanks for the, the comments. Cliff Young, anything you want to pick up on that that you saw in your polls? Well, well, generally speaking, Americans, both Americans and Canadians, um, see that, that products and services coming from the two countries in a relative sense is quite high, uh, especially relative to China and other sort of countries. But to Dan's point more specifically, and this is something we found both in this poll as well as polling on this subject over the last 10 years, um, you know, the devil's in the details. In other words, there's broad-based support for NAFTA, but many people question, how has it benefited me and my family and those that I know? And that's a very concrete, specific question. Um, and often people don't have concrete, specific answers to it, and therefore sort of an attenuated uh, support for NAFTA. And again, here's the uh, concrete, specific numbers that you found from that poll that you conducted earlier this week. 42% of Americans saying that NAFTA has benefited uh, the United States. 25% saying it's hurt the United States. 15% saying it's had uh, no impact. Uh, and about 18% uh, don't know uh, or uh, not responding to, to that question. Morton's in East Brunswick, New Jersey, an independent. Go ahead. Yes, I think part of the problem lies in not so much what President Trump is doing right now, and that's very sad, but I think it goes back historically to what Congress has done. And whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, or independent, I think one of the problems we have politically, which is very, very serious, and I don't know how to resolve this, is we have elected officials in Congress that have been there almost for a lifetime, whether it's Grassley on the Republican side, or whether it's Chuck Schumer on the Democratic side, or Mitch McConnell, whether they're good guys or bad guys, they've been there 30 to 45 or 48 years. I think part of the problem is they don't really represent the average American. And I think NAFTA has done a great deal. I have relatives in Canada, and I think it's an excellent program. It may have to be tweaked. But take a look at what, what the Republicans did to Obamacare. They basically tried to eliminate it and strip it. The same thing with abortion rights. They're changing a lot of the laws in this country or hoping to change that would not benefit the average American. And I think it's unfortunate. I'm 80 years old, and I've been a student of American political history, and I think we're in very difficult and dangerous times. And the reason I say that, you have to study the Weimar Republic. After the Versailles Treaty from 1918 to 1932, you've got to study what happened there historically and economically. And then look what's happening here. All this comment about fake news, about Mueller and so forth, this is very frightening. And all I'm saying is I'm glad that C-SPAN has been doing what they've been doing. I've been watching your program since its inception and keep up the good work. That's Morton in New Jersey. Anything you want to pick up on? Well, I think yeah, Morton is pointing out uh, a phenomenon, by the way, that we're not just seeing in, in the United States, but around the world. We see, we've seen over the last four or five years a rise of anti-establishment sentiment, um, support for outsider candidates. Uh, Trump represents that, and why is that the case? Because typically incumbency is king. The incumbents typically win. They have a three to four fold advantage over a non-incumbents. Um, and people are frustrated. They don't see change. Indeed, the, what we see in the United States is what we're seeing in Europe. We can take Brexit as an example. We're about to have an election in Mexico. We have an outsider candidate that's most likely to win there. And in Brazil, we have another election later in the year where we're, more like, we're most likely to have an outsider candidate win as well. So this is a global phenomenon where public opinion is frustrated writ large, uh, and they're not seeing how their daily, daily lives are being improved by the political order as is. And once again, we can understand Trump and America first in that context. 
you mentioned Mexico. Uh, this poll that you conducted focusing on the United States and Canada, have you ever conducted the, the same kind of poll in Mexico? Yes, absolutely. And indeed, for this this iteration, we did not include Mexico, but we have in the past. And they're very, very similar, uh, similar sort of results. Mexicans are in favor of NAFTA in general. Um, they believe they're less likely to believe that they benefit it from directly, though more so than Canadians and, and Americans. Um, and so I'm not seeing necessarily concrete things in my hand, uh, but I, in, in principle, I agree with the concept of, of NAFTA. That said, Mexico, Mexicans are much more um, in favor, much more supportive of NAFTA and the relationship than are Canadians or, or Americans. Delano is in Conway, Missouri, Republican. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to make a comment on we just had five children burned to death here in Lebanon, Missouri, and her mother injured. But the, what I want to talk about is the product coming in here from China, like the heaters, little portable heaters. I can plug one in while I'm taking a shower in the wintertime. And by the time I get out of there, that cord is so hot that you can't hardly – uh, grab a hold of it. There's no inspection. There's no UL improve uh, on this product coming in. We're buying trash. There was a guy just before me on washing machines. <clears throat> There's no warranty on anything. Delano, do you do you trust days. products coming from from Canada? No, this product is coming from China. But do you, in general, trust products that that come from Canada? I do. I have a Plymouth that was, I didn't know it, but it was made in Plymouth. It's, it's, it was made in Canada, and it's like uh, 21 years old. I've never had any problems with it. I don't have any problem with Canadian. The shipping in here in, from China, I've got two pages of product that is dangerous. I called my senator and talked to one of her aides. And he said, well, would you send me those two pages that you have? I said, that's your job. I'm just telling you, our congressman is failing us. That's Delano in Missouri this morning, bringing up China as the lead story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal today about China striking back at tariffs as trade war looms, Trump unveils levies on Chinese goods, and Beijing retaliates. My response to that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I would say sort of uh, China is much more of a softball than Canada. Indeed, people have a very positive view towards Canada. On the one hand, they believe its products are of high quality, like products from the United States. Uh, China is a very different story. There's a much more negative view of China among Americans, um, and there's a, and then there's an understanding that the quality of the products from China uh, are, are inferior to those of the United States and in Europe and 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 our more and our closer allies. Uh, so that's on the one hand, yes, there's greater support for I would say conflict with China than there is for um, with Canada in public opinion, and and more specifically, there is generally uh, broad-based support for regulation, uh, regulation of products, making sure that inspections are done. Um, and, and, and so uh, any sort of policies that sort of would align with that, uh, Americans would be in support of. Little Elm, Texas. Thomas is a Republican. Go ahead. Hi, John. Uh, hi, Mr. Young. Um, <clears throat> the products that are being made in, in Mexico uh, for for one thing, uh, you have like for example a lot of Kenmore stuff. Uh, you have to take out a basic warranty to make sure that they keep running because they'll break down. And I know I've had that experience already. But uh, NAFTA in itself is just a minute thing compared to the WTO. If you read the WTO, you'll find out that all of our congressmen, governors, mayors. Anybody that's associated with a federal, state, or local governments are exempt. But the worker who retires after 30 years of tenure, okay, and is a minimum of age 55, will have money taken out of their their entire retirement. And they call that a lump sum, according to the WTO Uruguay Round Agreement. And I suggest that this show here, John... I'm, I hope you're listening. Yes, sir. Uh, does a complete show, and it's going to take about a month, and pick up a copy, and you can go online and do it, of the Uruguay Round Agreement. And you're going to see what I'm telling you. And, John, you and this gentleman here with you, uh, Mr. Young, uh, when they retire after th after 30 years, okay, if they're not affiliated with the government uh, or work for the government, they're going to have a large sum of money. And, by the way, John... And Mr. Young, 
the more you make, the more they're going to take off the top, and it's not tax deductible. Hey, Thomas, let me ask you to bring it back to this poll that we're, we're talking about this week, and I appreciate the suggestion. Uh, the poll found 71% of Americans support NAFTA, 29% oppose. Uh, let me ask your opinion on, on polls, Thomas. Do you trust polls? No, absolutely. <laughs> polls are, for the most part, a synopsis of a minute category for where they ask people about this or that. And then it's only a small amount of group. When you're talking about, what, some like somewhere in the neighborhoods around 30, 335 million people in the United States <clears throat> and growing, no, that's, that's those polls, whether it's, whether it's for this type of thing we're talking about today on this show or whether we're talking about politics, polls are irrelevant. Thomas, thanks for the call. What do you say to that? Polls are irrelevant. Well, first and foremost, polls uh, it, let's set aside the quality of polls, and we'll come back to that, whether we're actually capturing public opinion or not. What we can say is that decision makers, both political and economic, use them all the time. Um, and so they want to, you know, politicians, governments, companies want to make sure they're aligned with it. They don't want to be at variance with public opinion in the long term because it has a lot to do with, you know, everything to do with electability and being able to push forward your agenda. Now, when it comes to us taking only a small sample of the population, like, let's think of it. It would be cost prohibitive to interview everyone every time we do a poll, correct? Um, and so we take a sample. And not to go into the technicalities of how you actually select a sample, but think of taking your blood. Uh, we don't take a, you know, we don't take all your blood out. Doctors don't take all your blood out uh, to basically run tests on it. They take a small little sample, um, and that's exactly what we do with the poll. A poll is a small little sample of the general population, um, which gives us a very good idea at that given moment about where public opinion is. Polling is certainly a discussion after the the 2016 mm -hmm. election and, and people's trust in polls. The final Ipsos forecast uh, published the day before the 2016 election gave Hillary Clinton a five point national lead, 44 percent to 39 percent among likely voters, and a 90 percent chance of winning the mm -hmm. election. What is your thought on what happened there? Well, first and foremost, that's a, that there was a you know a slight bias, uh, not just our poll but the polls in general. Um, and so she actually won the popular vote by 2%. We said 5%. For us, that was kind of in the, in the margin of error. Um, but all polls aired a few points towards Hillary. Um, and that, Why? And, and that, that's a great question. Why? Well, I'd say there's twofold reason. First and foremost, we were using a hammer, not a screwdriver. And so most of our resources are being allocated towards national polls. And we know in the United States uh, that actually only five, six, seven swing suites really matter. And that's where we made our errors. And so Ohio was perhaps the biggest one where the polling firms in general uh, missed. Um, and so first and foremost, we should have been polling much more in the swing states uh, specifically. And the other thing is, and we're, we're, we were talking about the rise of anti-establishment sentiment, um, it's changing politics in general. And so we have a new emergent political group, social, political demographic group. Um, you know, white, uh, non-urban um, individuals are beginning to vote more in unison than they had in the past. And all polls underrepresent them um, in 2016. Looking forward, uh, we're ensuring that we are representing them. And if we did in the correct proportions, uh, our poll, like the market's polls, would have been much closer. So you think things will change heading into 2018 and the, the 2020 election? Do you think we're going to have closer polling? I, I think so. Listen, I mean, if you take the historical average, uh, polls uh, you know, get the elections and about 85% of the time right. Um, and so ultimately, yeah, we were off. We were off a few points. Um, and we were off a few points in the Obama uh, elections or, or cycles as well, though we were on the right side of the fence, not the wrong side of the fence. But I, I feel fairly comfortable with polls. Uh, obviously, we have a very high bar. Every time something goes wrong or any time something goes wrong, uh, the industry in general, and Ipsos more specifically, we flux a lot. We improve our method and we, you know, we move forward. What do you fear is the, the biggest blind spot for polling right now? I think it's the same thing. I, I, I think that um, we're in a new political time. It's an age of uncertainty. Um, the political calculus of the past is not the political calculus of today. And we've been alluding to that a bit. The Republicans are very different than they used to be. And those sorts of changes in human behavior make it diff difficult for the method they use to capture and understand human behavior and, and public opinion. And so we just have to be much, much more um, doubtful and uncertain about our method. Uh, we have to do a better job of triangulating from multiple uh, sources. Um, but that is our challenge, that politics is changing, and therefore our method has to change as well.
Time for just a couple more calls with Cliff Young of Ipsos. It's Ipsos.com. You can find Cliff Young on Twitter at Cliff A. Young if you want to follow him. Char, uh, Camille, I'm sorry, is in Pennsylvania, line for Independence. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question for Mr. Young. I need to know what the population percentages are. What part of the population is he categorizing this representative of, you know, the country and the electorate? Where are the numbers, the actual numbers? I have the percentages there that I was looking at on his chart, but I see no actual participants in these surveys numbers that you got, you know, displaying. Could you answer that, sir, please? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, in, first and foremost, this is a, this is a poll that's representative of the, of the U.S. population by demographics, by region, by age, by gender, by education, by urban, non-urban. Um, and so we're not looking at voters. We're not looking at registered voters. We're looking at the general adult population, 18 or plus. And, you know, obviously we have a fuller what we call top line uh, on our website with all the breakdowns of the numbers and we'll go into more specifics. I think that she's w is saying she doesn't want just the percentages but the breakdown of the brute numbers or the gross numbers from our poll. That's all online and please go there to take a look. And it's Ipsos.com again. Cliff Young, the president of U.S. Public Affairs for Ipsos. Appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for walking us through the poll. Well, thank you so much.